radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, welcome, Fade to Black. How you doing? How you doing? Today is Monday, April 15th, 2024. Happy Tax Day, everybody. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Very excited about the show tonight. That's right. We have Dr. James Beecham here live from Geneva, Switzerland at CERN. We'll get to James in just a second. Uh, you can help support the show. Get yourself a Fade to Black t-shirt. Uh, there are two shirts, two ways to get them. The links are below. You can also become a Fade or Not four ways. The links are below. Help support everything that we do around here. Let's get straight to it. It's going to be a busy night on the show. This week, kicking off a Fade to Black tonight, Monday, Dr. James Beecham is here. Tomorrow night, Dr. Lynn Kate is here, and we're going to be talking about the Phoenix Lights. Wednesday night, Le Leslie Mitchell Clark is joining us. ET Hypnotherapy. What is it? We will be talking about that. And then Thursday night, Britt Elders is here. She has been researching the subject for the last 50 years, and I've been waiting to get her on the show I talked to Britt, uh, oh man, it was probably 10 years ago. And finally, Britt Elders is with us to wrap up the week on Thursday night. I also have six major events booked for the second half of 2024. And it's going to be a busy second half of the year. Uh, first up, I've got the Anunnaki TV premiere in downtown L.A. at the biggest cinema in Los Angeles at the Regal Cinema downtown. And uh, that's with Billy Carson and Forbidden Knowledge TV. And that is on uh, May 11th, May 12th. Okay, so uh, everything is available uh, below with links. Then I have Disclosure Fest, Stairway to the Stars at Castaic Lake uh, right here in California. That's the weekend of June 10th through the 12th. That is a huge event. Expecting about uh, between ten and 15,000 people uh, there for Disclosure Fest. That's going to be amazing. And then I go out to Miami for the 2024 Conscious Awards in Miami, Florida, and that's the weekend of August 3rd and 4th. Then I'm heading to Alaska, uh, contact at sea, uh, that cruise, September 6th through the 13th. There are still some tickets available for that. Then I head to Egypt uh, for the Egypt tour for BK, October 3rd through the 14th. That's right. I'm spending my birthday again this year in Egypt. And then when I come back from that, I head to South America, to Peru and Bolivia with Brian Forrester. And that is November 15th through the 27th. So that takes me through. Hopefully, I will be around for Christmas in December and I can take a breather. Links for info and tickets are in the description below on social media and over on our website. All right. Now, also... A little uh, uh, PSA announcement. I am expecting a package that was supposed to be here a couple of hours ago that I have to sign for. It is now two hours late, and I'm live on the air. So <laughs> that leaves me in a weird spot. And I, oh man. So uh, let's see what happens tonight with James. And uh, as I get the special delivery, maybe I'll unbox it on the air uh, with James. And I may have to rudely interrupt uh, the interview tonight. Wouldn't that be funny? First time for everything 
Right, right. Okay, let's get straight to it. Uh, tonight, live from Geneva, Switzerland, at CERN, uh, Dr. G- James Beacom is here. We're going to discuss his research at CERN. I've called this show tonight, What is CERN? Um, we're going to talk about not only his research and his search for new particles and and dark matter and, and dark, dark everything, <laughs> right? Quantum black holes. And, of course, uh, uh, Higgs boson and Peter Higgs, who uh, passed away last week at the age of 94, will be talking about that. He is a particle physicist, a science storyteller. He's a filmmaker. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher with the Atlas Institute experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN with Duke University. His work focuses for searching for new particles and, of course, dark matter, dark photons, quantum black holes, and and bosons. That's right. Now, um, he's known as a science storyteller. And tonight, it is going to be one of those conversations everybody knows on this show Uh, the things that I love to talk about. And it all falls under one umbrella. Everything hangs off of it. And one of my favorite things in the world, besides guitars and Van Halen, is physics, is science. This is something that I study and I research, and it's something that our community is deeply interested in. And we know my theory that one day, our little woo community and the world of science is going to be a head-on collision of a couple of trains. And we're going to be talking about that, too, as well. And I would like to welcome, for the first time, live from Geneva at CERN, Dr. James Beecham. There he is. James, good morning, young man. <laughs> good morning, yes. Four in the morning here for me, so very, very good morning. Uh, do you Do you have the night shift there at CERN? Oh, you know, I do not have the night shift this night. I'm kind of naturally a night owl. And so when I get invitations like this, normally, you know, I, I'm cool with it. I'm just like, okay, I'll just yeah, I'll save some work until the kind of later hours and then just kind of push through it. It's all good. But I am running on caffeine at this point. So yeah, we'll see, what, see what happens. That, that makes two of us. I'm sure you just heard my warning. Um, I'm expecting yes. a package that is late that I have to sign for. So um, if it happens early, I'm going to go, okay, James, uh, tell us about your childhood for two minutes. <laughs> and gonna, you're just going to ramble and then I'll dash back in. And if it happens at the halfway point, then we'll, at some point, we'll just take a commercial break and, no and get that solved. But, uh, yeah, very strange that anyway, let, let's move on. You get the first time guest disclaimer. Okay. And, uh, every first time guest gets it. And it is a tradition around here. And this is it. Before we proceed, you have to accept. And it is this James, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. You have to accept. I do accept this. Yeah. Okay. Sure. You'll click on anything, my man. Hey, I got to tell you. <laughs> not I, I, anything. I gotta, no, no, no. Not, I got to tell you. Guys. You guys got a pretty good internet connection there at CERN. We do. We have an extremely good internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, let's see. Just uh, one building over and downstairs was the hallway that looks very kind of antiquated and old where most of the technology for the World Wide Web was invented. So, yeah. Isn't that crazy? So I, I assume you could drive a bus through your Internet connection. I mean, you guys must be trading the amounts of data that you guys share and and also receive from around the world. It's got to be ginormous, man. It is. I don't know what the numbers are these days, but yeah, even to this day, the, you know, CERN is one of the main through points for the World Wide Web around the globe. So yeah, it's a, it's a major, major hub always has been. Um, And, you know, it's also because of, you know, its prominence in the world and its prominence in the world of computing. Um, not just in science, but computing itself, like you pointed out. It's also constantly subject to various, you know, attacks and things like this and like spam and all this, you know. So, yeah, I, I don't work in the IT department. I'm a physicist, but, you know, I trust those guys that they know what they're doing and they do. So One of the, uh, we're going to uh, jump straight into it tonight, but one of the things that, this is how my brain works. 
one of the things that impresses me the most about uh, engineering marvels like CERN or some of the radio telescopes around the world, you know, and in Chile and in the Anacama Desert, you look at that and I think to myself, yeah, it's cool. But the engineers and the contractors that designed and built it, what kind of mind puts that together? Because, I, you know, I've done all of the documentaries of CERN. I've done all the walk-arounds and the walkthroughs. And you just look at the infrastructure and how it was built. That's just as impressive as smashing particles together. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that I love about this research, one of the many things. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I do the research that I do and why I've chosen to, you know, devote so much of my life so far to this type of research. And one of the things is that this research is actually pretty unique. And you mentioned some other things like, you know, t uh, the telescopes and various things like this. Th this type of research, if you think about it, it's kind of weird in a way. I mean, for those of us here, we totally understand because we're curious about the universe, both the kind of edges of science and kind of going beyond the edges, those kinds of things. But if you think about it, there's like here at on site at CERN, there are thousands of people that come here every day and even more thousands around the globe that are still working on this research. We're all coming here strictly because we're curious about the universe. Full stop. We're not making a profit. We're not making products. We're not uh, looking for energy sources. We have nothing to do with militaries whatsoever. There's nothing like that here. We're strictly because we're curious about the universe and the type of discoveries that we make, the actual scientific discoveries, there's nothing you can do with them in a practical sense. Like when we discover dark matter, you're never going to be able to make dark buildings buildings out of it, right? That's not the way it works. And the Higgs boson particle, you know, we discovered this thing in 10 to the, in, what is it, uh, 2012, um, me and 6,000 of my colleagues, that's good. But, but you know, it, it you can't do anything with it. It lives for, when we make it in the, in the, in the collider, it lives for like 10 to the power minus 22 seconds. That's nothing. You can't, you know, the Higgs boson is not weaponizable. So this type of research is super, super fascinating because governments around the world support it with, you know, it's public money. This, that, that's, that's where the money, the funding comes from for this research. And so you then ask the question, it's like, oh, what, what are we getting out of this? Well, the, you know, to me, that's the kind of the wrong. I know you didn't ask that, but, you know, in principle, if somebody asks that question, right, you ask, well, what, what, what does humanity get out of this research? Well, you, we get answers to the biggest open questions of science, you know, the biggest existential questions of life and, and existence and the universe's existence out of it. And that in and, in and of itself is a, an answer. However, I can also, you know, because I speak around the world at various things, at big events, you know, and I sometimes get in conversation after afterwards with the kind of finance guy or the investor guy. It's like, yeah, but, but you know, what do we get out of this, like, you know, financially? And on, honestly, I can answer his question that way, too. It's been calculated, like you pointed out, all of these, like, engineers and the contractors and things, it's been calculated as something for, for every euro that goes into this research. It generates something like three euros worth of business within the communities where it came from. And it's the contractors are from all over the globe. So we can answer this question. <laughs> and as you pointed out earlier with the World Wide Web, this type of research, it's I, I think of it as open-ended humanity R&D. You know, if you if you want to be super practical minded, I know we don't want to here, so I don't know why I'm bothering to talk about it. But if you do, it's kind of open ended humanity RD. You know, anytime your species does something like this that it's never done before, and you know, when you need a 27 kilometer circular tunnel 100 meters underground, you can't just like call up Siemens and say, hey, we want to order one of those off, off the shelf. Like you have to make it yourself. Any anytime you do something that you've never done before, one of these engineering marvels, like you point out, you inevitably end up innovating new technologies that can be trans, uh, transferred to you know private sector. So, you know, obvious examples are things like the World Wide Web, but also, you know, if you've ever known anybody that's had a cancer treated or detected by like a CT scan or a PET scan, this is this type of technology was strictly a side benefit of my particle physics ancestor just messing around with part. No one said to themselves, huh, I want to look inside of a foot with with particles. They, they instead, this was a side benefit of somebody, you know, just messing out, trying to understand how particles work. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, the engineering marvels are, are fantastic in and of themselves. And then you have uh, and you're you're absolutely right. Then you have the mystique of CERN. And last Last week was April 1st, right? Last Monday. And the, uh, or two weeks ago, I'm sorry. And yeah. uh, one of the great practical jokes for April Fool's Day was done in England. 
And the local newspaper in this town ran a headline that said our town, whatever the town was called, right? Shepherdshire or whatever, <laughs> has <laughs> has been chosen for the next Hadron Collider being built by CERN, right? And the nine one right, the phone calls coming in freaking people out and and i gotta say that's a pretty good april fool's joke but that's also part of the mystique uh behind cern and how aware are you and and your partners there of of the the soap opera around the globe that centers i okay tell us how you got into physics <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So the first time I ever received a package, and it was in an awkward time, uh, was when I was a child and I was uh, playing video games at home, and I was just about to beat Super Mario Brothers, and I was like, "Oh, I can't believe it! I'm going to make it!" I'm going and there was a bell that rang, and I said, "Somebody get the door! Somebody get the door!" But it turns out nobody was home, and in fact, I had to stop my game to go and pick up the package from the door. And I was just like sweating profusely. I'm like, what's going to happen here? I don't understand. I like, uh, uh, please get it. And by the time I got back, I was out of my rhythm and I did not beat Super Mario Brothers. Are you back? <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, okay, so picking up where we left off, I, I'm glad that happened now. You know, there's a first time for everything. And you know what? I'm going to blame it on CERN. I'm gonna yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I, I think that it's sort of a grab bag. I, I you know, I, I am fully aware of it. I, I'm not sure if this is what you're going to ask, but I'm fully aware of all of the different types of conspiracy theories and things. I mean, again, I speak around the globe. I, 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 I don't do it anymore, but I used to have a very uh, a regular sort of TikTok live. It was extremely well attended and we would field all these kinds of questions. I feel like I've heard all of the conspiracy theories. And so, sure, why not? I think CERN was, we were responsible for your, uh, for your delayed package. Why not? You have to. I mean, the the amount of let's just, let me. Do you guys sit around in the cafeteria and 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 talk about the different conspiracy theories and giggle? I mean, you've got the Illuminati statue out front, right? So you've got that going for you. Um, but and the opening ceremony was uh, 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 something to behold. But when you have things like um, the Mandela effect or or Bigfoot is tied into CERN, right? It's just like it's so easy uh, to to do that because of uh, the knowledge that you guys are, you know, creating antimatter and and black hole black holes at CERN. And when you guys talk about stuff like this, well, black holes are supposed to eat everything. Yeah. And antimatter, if it touches anything, it's gonna leave a crater in the ground the size of Geneva. So you, you have these these fear things uh that are there too as well. So it's easy to tie conspiracies into CERN, isn't it? It's very easy. I mean, I think the the ease and the the willingness and the kind of attraction honestly comes from you know what we were talking about before. This is science really at the edge of our human knowledge. Like it really is. There's as far as we know, there's only one of these in the universe, right? I mean, this is pretty pretty strange. Okay, yeah, maybe there's other there's other civilizations out there, but and I would hope that they would possibly have more advanced particle physics programs than we do, but we don't have any evidence of that right now. And again, I'm an experimentalist at the end of the day. So, you know, show me the evidence. Um, and so, you know, there's only one of these and it's really doing some really fascinating things. And there's, and it kind of captures the attention because like I said before, we're doing this because we're curious, right? There's no like ulterior motive. There's no like secret, you know, product we're going to make and sell to people and make a million bucks. It's really because we're curious. We want to know what dark matter is. We want to know, you know, what's inside of a black hole. So I think that because of that, it, it attracts the attention and the kind of imagination of a lot of people. And once you have those ingredients, also when you combine it with stuff that's actually kind of difficult to understand, like quantum mechanics is pretty weird. It's very counterintuitive to our human, you know, the way that humans evolved. That's a good, that's a, you know, 
perfect recipe for kind of speculation that starts to get and the speculation can kind of run away with itself. And I, you know, I understand where that comes from. But and in fact, for me, I think it's fun to talk about these things. And to answer your question, no, we don't sit around and, and think about these things or, you know, all the time. We kind of just scratch our heads sometimes and anytime we become apprised of them. But, you know, we're, we're working all day on our research, not like we sit around and, and worry about what people are thinking about us. But when we do hear something, it's very almost it's like, oh, that's pretty weird. And then we but then the more the more elaborate ones were just sort of like, oh, boy, kind of a face palm thing. Um, and I think that this is this is the you know, this stuff is interesting because, you know, first of all, I hadn't heard the book Bigfoot one. I'm not sure how that happened. But the point of the black hole stuff that, you know, the, the really the you know, again, like a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of very, very speculative stuff. It doesn't matter if it has to do with CERN, but around the, the world as well, because I, you know, I speak around the globe of various things. I also talk about pseudoscience and uh, misinformation, disinformation a lot. And, you know, these things, they come from a kernel of something real. They come from a there's a kernel or a seed of something real. And then it sort of gets blown out of proportion. And in the case of the black hole thing, we don't we haven't made any black holes, but uh in principle it's a tiny little modified object that does satisfy the equations of a black hole that in principle we could have make or we could have made but we don't see any of evidence of these at all so again i can oh, go into wait, more detail wait, wait, wait 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 let's back up a step sure i oh man you're killing one of my fondest memories i thought that i reported uh on the news that I covered uh, a press release that very, very small black holes were generated at CERN. Are you saying that that never happened? No, no, no matter how tiny, but you're saying none have been created. That was the Mandela effect that we also caused. Really? <laughs> no, Man. that never happened. But, but what happens is that you do, we do get stories sometimes that say, you know, that that quotes somebody that doesn't exist, like typically in these sorts of like these tablo tabloids and things like that. It's like CERN scientist says we've done something we shouldn't have done before. And then the person doesn't exist. And somebody was like, you know, playing a prank, but the, they went along with it. I don't know. So, yeah, we've never made black holes. I mean, if we had, you would, you know, everyone would know about this. Like, this would be the most amazing discovery in the world. And it's like, again, the kernel is real. It's like this is something that we could in principle make. But we, it turns out that we've never, we can't make any of the Large Hadron Collider. We've looked for them. And in fact, it's not even a normal black hole at all. It's a little modified version of a black hole that has, the modification though is super fascinating. That to me is why I love to talk about these kinds of things because the, you have the conspiracy thing or the, or the kind of speculation thing, but the real science is actually way more interesting. So this little object that we we can in principle make but we don't see any evidence of the of them so far is not just a regular black hole it would be a little black hole that indicates that there are extra dimensions of space everywhere in space all around us little curled up dimensions that are imperceptible to you and me but this is where gravity preferentially exists like this is mind-blowing in and of itself there's no need for like the you know a fear about like a black hole to be created and then suck in the earth and to answer your question about the you know, this, the, the, the fear part. And I, I get where it comes from because we're sort of accustomed to science fiction where it's like black holes are these big things that suck in everything and suck in stars and stretch you into spaghetti. And okay, that's true for cosmic black holes in space, but really we can do a calculation with any black hole. It doesn't matter, you know, what, what size of a black hole you like, you, you can take, if, if you take your favorite textbook on gravity, and I assume you have a textbook on gravity on your bedside table, like I do, you just find do. the one that's, <laughs> good. I do. And I find literally the, do. <laughs> good, good. Well, you find the black hole equation and it tells you what, um, if you have a certain amount of mass, amount, amount of stuff, what size of a volume you have to pack it in, how dense you have to make it to create a black hole. And that's, it's really straightforward. So like if I wanted to make a black hole out of the entire earth, I would need to pack the entire thing into a volume about the size of a blueberry. And if I wanted to make a black hole out of the sun, I would need to pack the whole thing into a volume that goes around like the center part of London. And so I can do this with everything. I can do this with smaller things too. But the whole point is that, you know, when you have a black hole, you can also calculate this other thing based upon this thing you've call, heard called Hawking radiation, right? We know that black holes, they do suck in stuff over, a, but over long enough time periods, they run out of stuff to suck in and they would eventually have to evaporate. 
So like that solar mass black hole around London, that one, imagine it's just hanging out in this in space after something like I've, I'm going to get the exact number wrong, but something like 10 to the power 60 years, it would fully evaporate and just disappear. And like 10 to the power 60 is insane. Our current universe is only like 10 to the power 10 years old. So we don't have to, you know, we, that's that's far beyond what we will ever experience. But we can do this with small things too. So if I make a little black hole in the, in the Large Hadron Collider with two protons, like this thing is going to evaporate immediately before you'd even, before anything would ever notice that it exists. So in the way that, that it evaporates, it would make this kind of spray of particles that hits the detector, like the one that I work on called Atlas. And this would be an amazing uh, pattern. And if we see enough of those patterns, that could be, be indication that we're making these little miniature black holes that are not just miniature black holes, but evidence of extra dimensions of space, which is crazy. Yeah, I love so that part. I love that part. But where's the off switch? In case, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, because it, it's experimental. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's what you're doing. It's an experiment. You're looking for the results. Is there a chance that something could spin out of control, literally? No. In fact, it's not just me saying that. It's, uh, you know, my colleagues, they uh, they did, they took this seriously, right? Again, we take the serious, we take seriously the the concerns that people have. Again, because these are real concerns by real people, right? I mean, I've, I can't tell you how many times, you know, somebody has asked me, it's like, did I hear that CERN is trying to open a Stargate portal to hell? And I'm just like, I've heard this and I'm like, uh, you know, inside my brain, I'm like, what are the, what do these words even mean? But this is a real person with a real concern. So I want to take it seriously as much as I can. And my colleagues did this too, before the Large Hadron Collider turned on, even there were all these questions and worries about, oh no, you're going to make a black hole to suck in the earth. It's a possibility. There's a tiny, tiny chance that you could do this. And there's also this uh, even even more fascinating thing called strange lit matter, strange matter, which you can make, which is different from dark matter, different from antimatter. It's a whole different discussion. But they did a calculation. They, in fact, they put out a paper. It's like, okay, here, here are the possibilities that we can make these things. And they went through all the possibilities and they went and they concluded at the end, any of these things, if they were ever to happen, they would instantly disappear in a way that we could detect the outgoing stuff. So the science would still be interesting, but there's no danger to humanity in any way. So. And I, I, mean, I, I, often, I often say, we're going to stay right here. I often say, and I like the way that you started out the show. I, I often say that real science started to fade and stop with Isaac Newton. And hear me out for a second. And this is why. He studied religion. Obviously, foremost in mathematics, physics, alchemy, right? And he was open-minded in all areas, right? He was really outside of the box. Right? I mean, he was never inside of the box. And because of his... Uh, seeking of knowledge and understanding in all of these genres, we got gravity. And not only did it, 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 it's the reason why you and I are talking right now is because of Isaac Newton and GPS and gravity and, and what is going on around the, and, and, and that was 350 years ago. And we, we kind of lost it after that where, Spiritual. I'm not a you know I'm not a religious person, but I don't hold anybody accountable for for their own beliefs or what they want to study. What I do love is an open mind and curiosity, and and thinking and going out and then trying to figure something out. Where maybe it's the funding environment of, of today or whatever it is, but. There is no discussion of consciousness, or there isn't any driving off of the road. Your science is so narrow now that you can't think outside of the box. I, I, am I wrong in in thinking this way? Um, I, I don't know if you're wrong. Um, I do disagree, of course, with a few of the characterizations, and that's fine. You know, um, but I think that 
you're not you're not wrong in the sense that there is definitely throughout all the sciences, not just in physics, but all the sciences, and especially the academic science, and well, also private sector science because there's you know there's there are profit motives there and things like that. There there are trends in any science just because again, anytime you have humans doing something, it's a human endeavor. Humans have, follow trends and humans follow fashion and they follow ideas that are the ones that are in vogue at the time, and that happens in sciences as well, and that does as you kind of implied, that does translate over sometimes into making it more difficult to get some kind of wild out of the program project funded. That's true. Right. Um, right. And, and I think that's partially what you're what you're talking about here. Uh, and that's true. Uh, you know, I, I think I disagree with this, uh, you know, with the with the characterization of science more or less kind of slowing down or not really progressing in a big way since Newton, because we know that Newton was a very bright guy, but he was also wrong about tons of everything. <laughs> so, you know, we know, for example, that, that, you know, alchemy is, I mean, that was an interesting thing at the time, but we can demonstrate that it's not real. I mean, we know that this was not a science. It's, uh, it's been, it's been ruled out just like phrenology has been ruled out as a science uh, since, you know, since we've evolved because, you know, and keep in mind that, you know, yes, Newton's understanding of gravity was very, very good for the time. And it's not wrong. He's still right within certain realms of, you know, precision. But if you want to be really precise, you have to replace Newton with Einstein. So that's the thing. Einstein's version of gravity is a different formulation of gravity that is not Newton. And in fact, Newton himself said this. In fact, Einstein's general relativity from 1915 is vastly superior in almost every way, not only because it more accurately uh, and, and more precisely describes what we observe, uh, the way things move due to gravity, <clears throat> but also because it has a mechanism for how gravity works. And Newton didn't have this. And Newton said this. One of his famous quotes was that, you know, I, something about, I'm paraphrasing here. He said, I have, a, you know, yes, my equations describe how, how gravity, how things move due to gravity very well, but I have no mechanism for why this is happening. And I'm not going to pretend that I do. <laughs> so it's a, right, right, said right, right. I love that. I love yeah. that. Um, uh, I will, I said, yeah, I will I not. It will not feign hypothesis. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. Well, I'm not. Um, uh, I, I, I am not supporting or or say no. What I was re referring to with Isaac was his curiosity. That's the thing. His curiosity was limitless, and and yeah. he just he just didn't really care. He just took where his thoughts were going, and and he wrote a book about it. And that's that's. Sure. That's, that's what I think is missing today is that curiosity. And, well, let me ask you this, okay? Sure. I mentioned consciousness. And what, uh, what I do find interesting is uh, the hard sciences and physics, too. And you probably know where I'm going with this. The discussion of consciousness does not happen. Right there's a line in the sand. Right? There's just a line in the sand, yeah. and and it 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 just um, and and the the idea in the hard sciences is that consciousness may exist in a, a little bit in every particle, and you get a mass of something together, and eventually consciousness forms and and is created from the mass. Of, of something. And in our case, it's our brains, you know, and, and whatever there's that. If I was, I, I believe that consciousness exists in the non-physical, but maybe it's a little of both. N nobody really knows. But if I was at CERN, I would, if I had that PhD, if I was a physicist, I would go, you know what? Okay. Well, if consciousness is in a particle, let's go find it. <laughs> Let's go find it. Why? Why? Now, that's a funding environment that would be pretty tough, wouldn't it? You couldn't. You couldn't have that conversation with with the National Science Foundation. Yeah, you probably could not. Um, you know, you probably are going to guess where I can go with this. Is that I? I think that you know consciousness, I, and I think that the reason why funding would never happen for that is because the concept of consciousness doesn't really have anything to do with particle physics or basic fundamental physics. And I, I know where the arguments come from. And I, again, I, I think, 
I think most scientists do have a pretty open mind, honestly. I think that science is, you know, uh, science is a process. It's not a list of facts. And so, you know, you have to just kind of follow how the logic, logical argument goes and you have to design an experiment to test, test different hypotheses, blah, blah, blah. So I think science is a process and I think most scientists are pretty open-minded. I mean, really, you know, anything kind of lives or dies based upon an experiment. But for consciousness, you know, the, the whole idea, which I think is partially what you're getting at is, you know, quantum mechanics, as we know, quantum physics is a very weird thing to humans, as we talked about earlier, because the rules of the universe at the smallest possible scale are very counterintuitive because they don't behave the way that you and I do, right? I mean, you and me right here, there's basically a no, there's a, it's a completely negligible possibility that I will suddenly appear behind the wall back there. But this happens regularly in the quantum world. And as we know, there's all these kinds of things, superposition and Schrodinger's cat and, you know, and th these these things happen all the time. And really the, the you know, and so these things sound weird to us, you know, the kind of this notion of quantum mechanics is weird. It really just means that it's just an, that, that to me is just a consequence of the fact that humans did not evolve as a species. We did not evolve at the quantum level. We evolved at the level of this, this kind of fuzzy, friendly, you know, two meter high, you know, nice atmosphere, nice energy range from the sun type thing. And so quantum mechanics is, it does not affect us in any way. It really doesn't. And so again, you know, I know that some people like to talk about how, you know, quantum auras or quantum chakras or whatever they want to talk about, you know, and these words don't mean anything to physicists because they're not well-defined and there's no connection between these things. As you pointed out, quantum mechanics is only, you know, is only felt at the level of individual tiny particles and maybe up to a few thousand or whatever it is. They've seen quantum effects at, you know, a few thousands of particles by now, but a few thousands of particles is tiny. Like this is nothing. I think your body contains like what? 10 to the power 60 particles or something, you know? So a few thousand is still nothing. And so when you put enough of these things together, the quantum effects are just totally washed out. So there's no way for a human to concentrate hard and like, you know, manipulate quantum mechanics and change their particles. This is just literally not possible for humans to do. Uh, on the other hand as well, something happening quantum mechanically does not manifest in a microscopic way for us. And so I think that what a lot of people, or a lot of people that speculate in this direction, the way they're going is they say, okay, well, wait a minute, quantum mechanics, what you're saying is that it's probabilistic, right? It's it's based upon probabilities and chance, you know, in a way. And people hear the word chance and they think it's just completely random, but that's not exactly the way it works at quantum mechanics. Yes, it is probabilistic, but what it, it doesn't mean that just, you know, when I have an electron that could go any of possible way, it goes in all of them at the same time and with an equal probability. No, there's different ways you have to calculate this so that you know what the trajectories are. And so, but people take this and they say, oh, probabilistic in quantum mechanics. So that little probability part, that randomness, that part is the little, that's, that's the, that's the spark. That's the uncertainty. That's the kind of the, you know, the essence or the whatever that then leads to the way that the brain works in a particular way. There's, there's no evidence of this. People like to talk about it, but there's no way for me as a physicist to say, yes, this connects to that. It just, there's just no possible way well, <laughs> because what when about, I have a quantum oh, yeah. particle, when yes. I have a par quantum particle that couples to a macroscopic system, the quantum effects are completely gone. And to me, just to finish the thought, consciousness is, a, you know, it's quite straightforward. I mean, I, I don't, I pers personally don't understand why people obsess over this con concept of consciousness so much, because humans, we have this very complex brain, right? But what is a brain? What is the thing that I refer to as I? It's the stuff that's going on in my head, in my brain. And it's a very complex system of electrical impulses like neurochemical electrical impulses that's it like that's very straightforward it's completely rational it's completely uh, in principle it's completely we could simulate this if we had a strong enough computer and at some point we probably will there's nothing really there that's that's unnatural and again i'm the hardcore rationalist in the room right so if, to me you know supernatural things don't exist because if they did they would be natural does that make sense? So like, that's my sort of hardcore way of, you know, pushing back on this. This. this yeah, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Except um, the, we don't have, this is, this is where it gets funky for me. We don't have the right vocabulary to describe what you are trying to say. We don't have that yet because we don't understand it. I'm of the opinion that uh, our science and technology 
today deals with atoms, particles. That's, that's our science. How fast can we make it? How small can we make it? How much better can we make it in the physical side? The next advancement in evolution for us will be of what we can't see. That that's that's when we get to, you know when we get out of this technical wired world of of circuits. Once we get out of this and and get to the next level and understanding you know, how the how the brain works, how uh, entanglement actually comes into play, and and things like th- that we can't measure, we can't touch, and we can't put it in the lab. When we figure that part out, then we evolve. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I, I get where you're coming from. I think that, but you know, I think about, I hear what you say, and I think, okay, well, if that's true, then what you're really saying is that there are just some things that we don't fully understand right now, and eventually we might, and at that point, they will then be testable and in a laboratory and in a science setting, and at that point, they'll just be part of science, and that's fine because that's, that's right, actually. That's the right. But that's the way that's, science that works. Is, that's like, the way science works. And, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what, what I really love, um, man, James, that hair says, you know, exactly what you're talking about. I totally dig this. <laughs> I totally, <laughs> it, is, is this what most people don't understand? If you are a physicist or you're in, in science, it's, it doesn't matter, uh, chemistry. It's nothing but a series of corrections. Oh, yeah. Whatever you figure out today, somebody is going to tear it apart tomorrow. That's that's it. That's that's what science is. It is nothing but a series of corrections, right? Well, that's in fact, like I said, it's a process, right? It's not a list of facts. It's a process, and that and that if that's the case, then it never will end because yes, it's always updatable, and in fact, it's always uh, we always eagerly update our conclusions based upon new information all the time. And that you have you know this as a scientist, we have a current again. Science doesn't doesn't actually say this is what's true. That's not what science says. Science says based upon our current understanding this is the best description that we have of blah phenomena that's what science says and it's always updatable so as you pointed out i like to think of it not so much as not so much as you know it is a series of corrections but to me it's a series of um edits it's a series of updates right so that's what i said for example newton before like i said newton's not wrong i mean you know his version of gravity is not wrong if i want to describe the motions of planets and things to a certain level of of precision, then he's fine. But if I want to then go beyond that to something a little bit more precise or to describe a few other objects, then I need to update Newton and use Einstein instead. So this is, doesn't mean that it's wrong. Like for example, you know, the, the Higgs boson particle that we discovered, right? This is the last room. This was the last remaining piece of something called the standard model of particle physics, capital S capital M. And it's this fantastic series of math that's, that, you know, very precisely describes almost perfectly describes nearly everything around you and me, like all the time. It's, it's actually one of the most, in, you know, impressive intellectual achievements of humankind. However, we know for a fact that it's incomplete because it only describes 5% of the universe. The rest of the universe is stuff called dark matter and dark energy, and we don't know what that is. So we know that the standard model is it's not wrong, it's incomplete. And once we find what dark matter is, find what dark energy is, these kinds of things, then we'll need to expand the standard model and include some other things. That's typically what happens. So it doesn't mean that our, what we're doing now is wrong. What it means is that we need to add on to it and we need to, again, it, maybe the words you're using correct is fine. Sure, we need to find the places where it's incomplete right now and make that complete jump. And I think it's probably the case, you know, obviously I think it's the case with things like consciousness. I mean, again, I, I'm I'm one of these hardcore skeptical guys where I think that the, a lot of the discussion around consciousness is not, is not so well defined. And so I think that if somebody really wants to, you know, because part of it is also something that I think is relevant to, you know, a lot of your interests too. And maybe you're, you know, the, those of your community too, is that, you know, who are we to say that our version of consciousness is anything special? Like, uh, how, 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 how do, why do we think ours is so so special? Why is it that, you know, you've heard about this before, you know, the, for, for, perhaps there are civilizations somewhere else in the universe. There are alien civilizations or something like that. But they interact with the universe in a different way that is not not exactly the same as our consciousness. And so 
they could be in principle sending us signals and we don't have the capacity to understand them. Now, 100%, like if I have, 100%, if I have, 100%. If, I have, if, I, if we take the, you know, Newton, if we take Newton's Principia and we go and give it to a Bonobo right now, the Bonobo doesn't suddenly understand Newton. He like looks at it and eats the pages, right? I mean, that's maybe that's what we're doing right now. We don't know this. So I think that, you know, this notion of what consciousness is, it's very, I'm not saying you're doing this, but these a lot of these discussions to me are very kind of human centered and very kind of uh, hubristic. And like the entire history of physics has been decentering, despecializing, or if you will, de you know, making humans not as special as we seem, as we think that we are, right? Back in the day, you know, we thought, oh, well, we're at the center of the universe and God is a bearded white man and makes everything happen. It's like, well, then science said, well, no, that's not the case. Uh, we're not at the center of the universe. Uh, oh, okay. Well, at least our solar system is at the center of, no, it doesn't, turns out that's not special either. <laughs> so this whole series of, you know, hundreds of years of reminding us to be humble, reminding us that you know we're not we're not so super special in the universe but that's and that also we need to be humble in terms of not pretending that we know everything right now which is i think kind of what you're getting at which i totally agree with i think and yeah, yeah, that's yeah, like yeah, built you're right. into science that's built into science is that we yeah. always leave open the possibility to update well yeah it goes without saying you know copernicus and galileo that was pseudoscience at one point you know, and that's 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 crazy to think about now, and and pseudoscience uh, to me is is okay. Let me tell you why it's okay, because the ideas of uh, something like string theory, or the ideas of a multiverse, or eleven dimensions, or a, Years ago, that was pseudoscience, science fiction, Gene Roddenberry, you know, Arthur C. Clarke stuff. And today, that's exactly, if you, the, pseudoscience is what physics is telling, trying to convince us that these algorithms are, are presenting themselves as. It's, it's pretty bizarre if you, if you really think about it. And to, to go into an 11 dimension or string theory multiverse, uh, multi-dimensional qubits, right? Quantum computing is frigging science fiction, man. <laughs> that is as <a> science <laughs> fiction as it gets, right? And, it's and pretty wild, so, yeah. yeah. And so it took pseudoscience to get us there. Yeah. I, you know, I think I, I, I would, I try to distinguish between real well real pseudoscience but uh you know that's a funny thing <laughs> to say right I, I like to i like to yeah non pseudo pseudoscience <laughs> yeah right right no, right right I, I like to i like to distinguish between you know legitimate sort of true truly pseudoscientific ideas mm -hmm. and just speculative ideas right I, I i think of these as kind of two different things in my head and i think what you're referring to if i understand correctly is a series of things that were speculative ideas right and you know in the past something that was very speculative and seemed kind of out of the mainstream of scientific thinking eventually it became the truth and it became the best description you know the because that's how science works if you have a new idea and it's based upon logic and reason and science itself and a you know a logical syllogism that uh, that follows from all of our observations it may take some time but if your idea is better supported by the observations, your idea will win. Like that's the thing, it's totally true, that's that's what happens. But if you have an idea, so you know, I think of these as speculative ideas, speculations, that's one thing, that's fine. But true pseudoscience is when you have some kind of idea, to me at least, you have some sort of claim that's being made that is, that is sort of nonsensical down deep down inside. It's like it, it's if you start asking questions to get down and down and down, it, you realize at some point you capitulate to some idea that is not well defined scientifically, does not follow scientifically from 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 the postulates, and is also not testable really in any way, not even in the future. So that's like true pseudoscience to me. So for me, <clears throat> this notion of String theory. String theory is is totally scientific. It completely is, to my mind, because it is just it follows completely logically from all the science that's come before. 
And it comes to the point where we see, the, you know, it, the postulate is that there are these tiny, tiny, like you said, 11 or 25 or something like this, curled up dimensions everywhere, you know, and once you get to small enough things, you'll see that ele an electron is not a point of something, it's a little loop or something like that. And all the particles are like that. Yeah, that's great. It's not testable now. It is in principle testable in the future, but we can't test it right now because we don't have an energetic enough collider to look down to such small distance scales. And yeah, that's true. That, it, it, yeah follows, that, it follows logically. And it's it's totally logical, and it's the same the same with the multiverse idea as well. If you have someone who you know tells you, oh, the multiverse is pseudo scientific, that person is wrong. If you have someone who also says, is, or who, who uh, simul or you know uh, alternate alternatively says, we definitely live in the multiverse, that person is also wrong. What it is is the multiverse is an idea that follows logically from our current understanding of the universe. And again, we can go you know you probably know the details, but it comes to this conclusion that is a very, very nice way to explain some of the wild and unexplained things about the universe now. The problem, of course, is that we can't test the multiverse idea now. I like to add that now part. I will never, again, it's it's like egotism and hubristic. I will never be so hubristic to think that somebody in the future will not be able to come up with a way to test it. Maybe they will. So I, I like to distinguish between these two types of things. But you're yeah, right, sometimes they, very they, wild ideas then sometimes turn into science. I, I agree with that. With with string theory, and you know, I I read, I play a physicist on TV. Okay, <laughs> so I, I can hang in a conversation with you guys. I I I, I fa I'm fascinated with it, but but the concept. I want everybody in the audience to understand something that they may not have heard before. The string, just like a guitar, right? Okay, a string. Right. Okay. So that vibrates at the smallest of the smallest of the small. And I'm simplifying it uh, very much. Um, I'm dumbing it down. This is my version of it. Vibrating strings determine what something becomes. And as the vibration changes frequencies, something else is created. In its simplest, simplest form, but that string is so small that if you take the atom that that string is in and you blow it up to the size of the Milky Way, the string is the size of an apple. Now that 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 that's it. I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. And how will we ever right? How will we ever be able to see a string now? That's question number one. Question number two, is one of those strings consciousness? That's number two. <laughs> That's number two. Okay. And number three, how small is small? Because that string is composed of something. Yep. Okay. Now, <laughs> so as small as it is, it's made of stuff. Okay, so that's three things with string theory that that I think need to get addressed. It's crazy. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, the you know, and in fact, the first one though, I have an answer for you. Um, so again, string theory is only currently not testable. It is in principle testable, and in fact, in a very di direct way. So, um, and in fact, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm I'm one of the uh, I'm one of the only people in my field who really works on this in a kind of in a kind of um, earnest way, because I like speculation. Like I said it before, I really do enjoy speculating at the edges of our knowledge. So you can think of it this way. So you know how we have these enormous. Did, did I describe? Did I describe it pretty pretty good? Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. I mean, again, like, I think just to capitulate what you said. Again, everything around us in the you know around you right now it looks like it's solid, and you know, and and uh, you know, this this desk is solid and everything. But if you were to look at it at a small enough scale. We know that it's not just a completely solid something. It's made up of little chunks of something. You ask, how small can I cut something? When I was a child, you know, I would, I remember I was, I would sometimes get a piece of bread and I would just like, kind of like look there and I would kind of crumble it. I would look at the crumbs and I would see, and I would just think to myself, how small can I possibly go? <laughs> right. And of course I would go really, I, it, cause it blew my mind. I'm like, wait, I, ha, wait, how small is small? Like, I want to know what's the edge, like what's, what's happening down there. 
And I would go to the library and read books and encyclopedias about this kind of a thing and learn that things are made of molecules. And you think, can I cut a molecule? And you, yes, a molecule is made up of atoms. And you ask, can I cut an atom, quote unquote? Yes, a an atom has a nucleus in the middle and an electron's you know, moving around it. And you ask, can I cut an electron? And the answer is, as far as we know now, no. That's just as far as we know now. And then you ask, can I cut the nucleus? Yeah, of course, it's made of protons and neutrons. Can I cut a proton? Yeah, it's made of quarks and gluons. Can I cut a quark? As far as we know, understand now, the answer is no. But as you pointed out, this is based upon just our current understanding of the universe. In fact, this idea that we, in fact, we model an electron, like a, you know, you can model an electron moving through space as like a little chunk of something, like a little pebble. You can model it that way. Sometimes you need to model it as a little wave packet, but you can think of it as a little chunk. But it, as far as we understand, it's a zero volume chunk. It has no spatial extent. It still can carry things, energy and momentum and stuff, but it's zero volume. But it's not exactly zero. We model it that way because it's so small small that it's beyond the level of human you know, comprehension at the moment. But really what we mean is that there is a built-in limit to our, our, our ability to even postulate distance scales down below a certain level. And this is where it's related to strings, as you know, because quantum mechanics, like we talked about earlier, quantum mechanics, which is the way the universe works at the smallest possible level, has built-in uncertainties to it. It's probabilistic, which means it has uncertainties in it as well. And what that means is there's certain uncertainties, errors in there, below which it's not even physically meaningful to describe a smaller distance scale. So we have something called the Planck length. You've probably heard of Max Planck and this brilliant guy. And back in the day, like he thought to himself, he's scratching his head like we all do. And he's like, huh. So we have all these constants of nature that have dimensions like C, the speed of light, right? This is distance over, you know, over time. And then we have like the the H bar, which is the quantum mechanical constant, which is joule seconds. Why is that there? We have the, the gravitational constant, which is just a number. Why are these just numbers? The electron charge, why are these numbers just the way they are? But he's like, okay, but if I put some of these together in a certain way, I can make very, very simple quantities that we use in physics. So like energy, the Planck energy, and time, the Planck time, and length, the Planck length. And so you put these together and you come up with these numbers that mean that beyond that, beyond that, that, uh, that scale, it's not even physically meaningful to define a distance smaller than that because there's no way in principle even for us to ever f formulate a measuring stick that could measure something smaller than that because quantum mechanical fuzz would take over. And this is, I think the, the Planck length is like what, 10 to the power minus 35 meters or something like that. Right, something, right, right. Something tiny, or maybe t 10 to the power minus 42, something like that. But the whole point is that this is, you know, related, related to what you're talking about, right? Is that to be able to see, quote unquote, this small, small level, again, this is, this is, it is not zero, 10 to the power minus 35 is not zero. It's very, very small, but it's not zero, right? So that means that there's some kind of fuzz there. And with string theory, the idea is that, well, wait a minute, if we were ever to be able to look down at such small scales, then maybe we would not see a little kind of only like a little fuzzy quantum mechanical packet. Instead, we would start to see, as you pointed out, a little loop of string that's vibrated in a certain way. And the way it vibrates, as you pointed out, an electron will vibrate in one way and then a quark will, an up quark will vibrate in another way, etc. So if we were able to be able to see at that level, quote unquote, see, this would all be revealed. And the way that we see things smaller and smaller scales, paradoxically, we have to build larger and larger collider <laughs> experiments because of that energy thing. So you remember the Planck scale, the Planck length. There's also the Planck energy. These things are related. So if I were able to reach the Planck energy in a collider experiment, I would be able to, quote unquote, see the Planck length. However, the problem is that we would need such an enormous collider to reach the Planck energy. It's not possible by our civilization right now. So it, by some calculations, <clears throat> the, uh, to reach the Planck energy in a collider, and in fact, I have a paper in, in preparation about this right now with a colleague of mine. <laughs> We're going to publish this in a few months. Um, we would probably need a collider like the Large Hadron Collider, but that circles around the sun, some distance, you know, maybe around the orbit of Mercury or something like that. 
So this is this is not possible with our civilization to do. If we were able to do that, though, that would be a guaranteed discovery. We would be able to understand what's happening down at the level of the string scale, if if anything is there at all. If string theory is right, we would that would tell us what quantum gravity is. We would definitely be able to make miniature black holes, the small ones that uh, that evaporate. So this would be a fantastic thing for us to do. Sadly, it's not going to probably happen in our lifetime, but this is where string theory comes from. So it is, in fact, a testable hypothesis. It's just not testable by our civilization right now. The uh, We're going to take a break here in a minute, and I'm going to set up for when we come back. Um, the dark is the trend word, right? It's pretty trendy right now. Pick something, put dark in front of it, and you've got something, right? And 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 speaking with the physicist, that's a good joke. That's a good joke. That's a that's a that's a pretty good one. But um, it's really funny how far we have come since 1915. And if you think uh, about between uh, general, even special, right? And just 60 years later, 60 years, we had Woodstock. You know, how much, you know, how much creativity and invention happened in such a short time? Dark matter and the ideas behind it were always kind of there, right? I mean, kind of, kind of discussed, but it wasn't until uh, uh, Edwin Hubble, 1922, we know what happened, all right, Mount Wilson, and he sees something. It took eight years for his paper to get published that the universe wasn't static. Einstein didn't even buy buy it, right? He had to go up yeah. and look through the telescope himself at, at Mount Wilson. So, so they see that, but they thought that it was going to slow down. That, yes, that it's not static, and there's movement uh, with with these cosmic bodies. We see that, but gravity is going to take over. So that expansion is going to slow down and possibly collapse back on itself. Big Bang starts all over again. Wash, rinse, repeat. Right? That was kind of like the idea, and then there was a foundation there for a long time. And 1998, man, the world got rocked, didn't it? And it wasn't only expanding, but exponentially so, exceeding the speed of light. Now we're into crazy town, right? That That's where and the only thing that could be causing it has got to be this, is this dark energy stuff, right? <laughs> right? We don't know. We can't see it. We can't measure it. Um, but you know, the mass of the universe, we can, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. just like everything got tipped over 25 years ago. It's, it's, it's a crazy thought process. Absolutely. The, do you want to set it, up for after the break or do you want to talk about it now? Well, uh, did, were you surprised, um, uh, as these revelations started to take hold because it, it, it changed everything that that uh, 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 astrophysics and astronomy yeah. and, and everything else was based on. Yeah, so, I mean the the discovery of dark, you know, of the accelerated expansion of the universe was just as earth shattering as it should have been. I mean, that's a that's a fantastic discovery. And again, as you pointed out, you know, we didn't know, you know, any physical system anywhere in the universe, there's some kind of fight between various forces. You know, this is always going on all the time, like even you sitting in your chair, right? Gravity wants to pull you toward the center of the earth. But if you were to zoom in on the atoms between, you know, your pants and the seat, you know, that you're on, you have these atoms that are fighting against other, each other with a combination of electrostatic repulsion, but also something called Pauli pressure, which is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. Those things are fighting in aggregate against gravity. So there's always some kind of forces going on. You're, you're being pelted with you're being pelted with photons and things like this. There's also the case in the universe. Right. So that, as you pointed out. People thought, oh, okay, well, the universe is static. And then, oh, no, 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 everything seems to be moving away from us. Oh, crap. Okay, well, that means, but then gravity eventually will probably win. So, yeah, we'll have this sort of like big bounce or whatever like this, a big crunch. 
Um, but then in 1998, like, no, this is not. <laughs> in fact, it's 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 something happened a few you know billion years ago. Something sort of turned on in the universe, and the ex expansion of the universe started to accelerate. And it's and it's going to keep going forever, as far as we understand. It is never going to slow down. It seems like gravity will never win again. And that was super super weird. And I mean, I, I completely agree. I I was I was you know when I first learned about that as a as a student, I was just like, whoa. This is like mind blowing. Yeah, because if if we take it just in its fundamental basic form and idea, it would suggest to me that there are worlds and galaxies that we uh, seriously we will never see, like ever, never. ever, never. ever. They're dropping off okay. the edge of a cliff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, we have to keep in mind there's, you know, when we talk about the universe, right, there's actually two concepts we need to keep in mind. One is called the observable universe, right? Mm -hmm. And the observable universe is a sphere centered on you that contains all of the stuff that has sent a light signal that has had time to get to us yet. And that's that stuff. That's that. And then we know it's something like, what, 97 billion light years in diameter, something like that. However, right. we don't know for a fact that that can't be the entire universe obviously there's stuff beyond this cosmological horizon and the ant the the open question is how large is the uh, the the entire universe we don't know it's it's nearly impossible to to answer that question it could be infinite in size it has to be something like what at least 500 times as large as well, you know the observable something like that based upon various theories so keeping these two concepts as, in mind is is you know again sort of mind-blowing if you think about it i mean i it, it's also to me it's a very it's a very kind of profound statement of the limitations of human knowledge you know because we have this cosmological horizon and no matter how quickly we will you know we travel we'll never be able to get to that horizon that's the whole point of horizon because we'll go toward it and then you know other things might you know it, we'd never be able to get there and that's a very profound limitation to our it's humbling, isn't it? Understand. Yeah, it's it's, it's humbling. So. Yeah, it's so humbling. Much so. Um, the, this is another reason why, was well, which is another reason why I and many other people are, of course, intrigued by some of the some of these possible observations of large scale structure in the universe. Talking about this whole, whole kind of static universe thing, right? This notion that there's also this this long standing concept of the fact that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Basically, it's it's the same everywhere in all directions if you look. But then there's these claims co that are coming out now in the last few, I think with, you know, with the web telescope and things like that, people are starting to see, you know, if you zoom out to very, very large scales, you suddenly start to see a couple of structures if you squint just right at your data. And these are super weird because why should the universe, you know, be non-homogenous to the level of like, you know, a few percent when we assumed that it was that way, you know, it was a hundred percent homogenous in all, in all directions. So I, it, we have to, of course, be skeptical about this because not all astron astronomers agree that these features, the, you know, which you probably heard about, and if you, you may, might, be, might even have had somebody on the show about, you know, these features, the big wall or the big, what's it called? The big wall or the big, the big curve or something like that. A lot of people say, no, these, these are not real. You know, you're looking at the data wrong. And this is the well, there's also There's data. also, there's also voids too that, that don't make no. any sense. And it would suggest, man, we, you know what? See, the, <laughs> let's take our break because we could just keep going. It would suggest to me um, a couple of things that, yeah, Newton was was wrong, but so was Einstein, and so was everybody else, right? <laughs> In that um, it, there are fluctuations in everything, and that includes dark matter, dark energy, gravity, the speed of light, that they're variable and there isn't a, a constant in the universe. There, there may be packets where there are, is no dark energy, where there is no movement. And, and then there's other parts where uh, light is slower or light is faster. And, and Einstein said it himself, right? Uh, uh, the fabric of space, it's bent. 
uh, light is is traveling and, and gravity will bend it and you can see light from behind a, a piece of mass. We, we all know about this now, but that would suggest to me that the speed of light isn't constant. We have to have a constant fixed number so the equations work, right? You can't use different, you can't yeah. use different numbers, but it would suggest that uh, as well. And I think that's what we're finding out. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the speed of light being constant is is pretty well established. I'm, I, I think it's not just a, a convenience of the equation. It's just that we've never seen any deviations from this, right? I mean, we, for, and by deviations, I mean, we've never seen anything go faster than the speed of light. And, you know, I've been asked the question sometimes, it's like, well, why not? Why, why, why is it not possible for something to go faster than the speed of light? You know, information to go faster than the speed of light. And the answer is that we've never seen it happen. <laughs> so, you know, again, the number itself. Entanglement. Yeah, but that's not, but as far as we understand now, we can't actually manipulate quantum entanglement to send a signal. But if it is occurring, all right, just in, again, in a general sense, one particle affects the, the rotation of another particle, no matter what's in between or the distance, and it happens at the speed of now. Well, if that interaction is possible, and and I guess the Chinese say they've done it, right? That's another discussion uh, for another time, but that's faster than the speed of light. That's the speed of now. Yeah, I mean it is, but it's also one of these. It's one of these things that you're you're still constrained by the way that the particles were uh, arranged beforehand, right? So I mean, quantum entanglement is is a bizarre, fascinating phenomenon. But you know, as far as we understand, I still can't I I still can't manipulate that in a certain way to send a signal to the person that has one that's far away. Yeah, it is something that happens now. But, you know, it's one of these things that I'm still prohibited from sending information that way. You know what I mean? Because, again, we, we do know things, quote unquote, things that can go faster than the speed of light. For example, the, the you know, the flow of space, right? If I, you know, if I have a, pa a, a little pocket of space, you know, space time, but space going into a black hole, once it goes over the event horizon, yeah, from another perspective, that space is flowing inward faster than the speed of light. That's the whole point. That's why light cannot get out of a black hole is because Correct. there's no trajectory. There's no trajectory. Once it gets in the black hole, there's no trajectory that it can ever get outside. So, okay, that, so this is something quote unquote, that is moving faster than the speed of light, but I still can't use that to send an information because I'm still constrained by light signals themselves. Well, does, so, does information then disappear? Uh, Ooh. inside of a black hole. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, that's a that's a good open question for the cosmologists and the people, you know, my cosmology colleagues that work on this kind of a thing. The best understanding now is that this is likely the whole information paradox thing is um, avoided by the postulate that over long enough time scales, like we talked about before, black holes will evaporate and they will give up all of the information that they did suck in. And again, this is based upon whether, you know, uh, assuming I think that a black hole is not like a wormhole to some other point in space and time or like a, you know, a little seed of a baby universe or something in a multiverse or something like that. But if, if a black hole will evaporate over a long enough time scale, if I had, you know, if stuff went into the black hole and then I were, I had some enormous, really precise detection material that I could detect all of the Hawking radiation come of, coming off of it for its entire lifetime as it's evaporating. Then I could recreate exactly what went into the black hole, which that's right. So Hawking, right, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Hawking radiation could be the information if you could reassemble, right? Throw it, throw it through some type of, uh, a to D converter. <laughs> Be a, a radiation to analog, an RA converter, radiation to analog yeah. converter. Um, let's go. take our break. James, fantastic conversation. Just stay right there. We'll be right back. This is Fade to Black live from Geneva, Switzerland at CERN. Dr. James Beecham is with us. More with James after this short break. Stay with us.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get your alerts and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial free for just $2 a month. This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest and the number one podcaster in the world, Sean Kelly. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. Post a picture. Send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. Everything includes shipping, and you're going to get a tracking number. And with a Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go back, Lee Tappy. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. 
River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, live from Geneva, Switzerland. At CERN, Dr. James Beecham is with us tonight. Fantastic, perfect conversation. And let's 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 stay on the faster than light uh, uh, soap opera wagon, mm-hmm. if we may. Uh, lots of discussion and debate, not only in in your circle. But just out there in in general, uh, th- uh, that uh, traveling at, at uh, you know FSL faster than the speed of light is indeed possible. Uh, let's let's start there with what side of the fence are you on with this? Oof. Well, um, yeah, plain vanilla versions of this are not possible. So we know that again, the light light speed is really an you know a kind of upper limit on speed for which stuff can you know uh, move through the universe and that means you know information light signals and again you know the the discussion we had earlier is obviously much more complicated than we really had time for with this whole co- quantum entanglement and quantum communication thing it's like you know yeah the chinese group they they have shown for example that they can still manipulate this to have in principle very secure quantum communications, but that doesn't mean this still doesn't allow you to send a signal or send information that's faster than light. It's it's fairly subtle, but um, so this notion of sending something faster than light, we have no evidence of this so far. Um, however, in principle, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm not really on a side of, uh, of any fence. I just think that until we see some observation that indicates that it's possible, then it, it, we can rule it out at the moment. So in terms of people moving faster than the speed of light, okay, plain vanilla version is not possible. So as you know, you know, from standard Einstein, right? It's like if I have something that has mass and the faster that I make it go, the more mass that it seems to have. And then it goes almost, and it has this sort of like infinite, you know, uh, infinite thing. So if I have just, if I try to push myself a little bit faster, then I will instead start to even gain more mass and it's, you know, if I get to the extreme part. So it's basically impossible to take something that's massive and make it go at the speed of light. In fact, that's why your particles, you know, quarks and electrons, they don't actually move at the speed of light. They move at some tiny, tiny, appreciably, uh, nearly unappreciable fraction of the speed of light, smaller than the speed of light. And, but, but light, light, you know, zero mass particles, those are the ones that move it at the speed of light, Ma- uh, photons and gluons and things like that. Um, And so moving faster than the speed of light seems to be basically impossible. And so, you know, and there's also a practical issue from the plain vanilla version. And when I say plain vanilla, just taking like a spaceship and pushing it faster and making it go faster and faster and faster. Um, If you were to take you and put you in a spaceship and put you, you know, going to say you want to go to see Alpha Centauri or something like that. um, I think they did the somebody did the calculation that I think if you get to around 40 or 50 percent of the speed of light, that would be so fast that you would have random space dust that you would inevitably run into. That space dust would be going into your spaceship so quickly that it would destroy it and kill you. <laughs> so, well, yeah, one little, issue. yeah, I can, I can only imagine the uh, the kinetic energy of yeah. hitting a piece of space dust at at half of the speed of light. I mean, that it would it would be insane. It would be insane. It would be crazy. Well, I, Okay. So okay. Part of what you're, oh, oh, oh. Just to finish the thought, but part of part of what you might be, you know, but the way, of course, to get around this, and that, you know, so no one thinks really that we can make humans or you know things. We don't think we can make them go faster than the speed of light. So people instead think about: Are there ways that we could look at 
very closely at the equations of general relativity. And maybe there's a way that we could sort of rig up some device or some, we could arrange the fabric of space time such that it would appear as though I have moved faster than the speed of light because I've moved my little, I've somehow made it arranged so that my little pocket of space around me was able to somehow tunnel to some other point of light. And so this is this is more likely what we refer to as uh, in speculative fiction and also speculative science as these so-called faster than light drives. And one of them you probably have heard of is called the Alcubier drive. There was this Mexican physicist, Al, uh, Miguel Alcubier, had this fascinating idea where it's like, okay, if I wanted to in principle go faster than the speed of light, then I, what, I, I can't do that plain vanilla version. But what if I were to arrange a little bubble of space time around me such that I kind of, if I wanted to go, quote unquote, in that direction, I would sort of bunch up the space time in front of me with a special device. And then behind me, I would stretch the space time behind there, behind me. And then that's my little bubble would, would in a sense be be moved from one point of space time to another point of space time. And if that's the case, then, you know, in principle, this could be, this could be a way for, you know, your little bubble to move. Okay. This is in principle possible, but then I'll, other people look more closely at this and to arrange this in a certain way, the sort of domain wall you would have to create in some way. And then you need something like you would probably need exotic matter that has negative energy density or stuff, stuff we've never observed. And, but in principle, other people look at this immediately and say, okay, if you were the domain wall you would have, you would have, it would have to be so thin that it would immediately, like anything would jostle this and destroy it. So there's all these practical limitations that come in anytime you have. Yeah, even Miguel, really even Miguel now, he's kind of backed off of it. He was like, man, you know, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, yeah. I was smoking weed that day. It was a good idea. <laughs> it was a good idea. In principle, but but when we when we think about this, the intelligent life, okay, it's a numbers game, James. You know this. Where uh, today, it, it's generally accepted that every star has at least one planet. Every star, if that's it, that's it. Every every single one, it's part of the formation of things. All right, okay, so we accept that. Uh, how far we have come since 1995 with exoplanets, right? Okay, so if that's the case, and and the amount of galaxies that are in the observable universe, and we're talking, you know, the trillions, and each one of those has trillions, and then there's trillions of planets, it's it's such a huge numbers game. So if if there is intelligent life out there, which there is, I. In, to the infinite but the question is how would they get here and they wouldn't do it with our level of understanding right now and our understanding of physics they would do it because it's kind of like miguel had presented they're just taking a step yeah right they're not traveling ten thousand light years forever steering a ship sitting in a seat right for, right for for a few million years no they're doing it because they wake up in the morning and they go ah let's go to alpha centauri sure right? and and if if that's the case um to fold space or to do th man i sound like i'm reading from the dune book or something <laughs> i don't want to go to i, I don't want to go to that extreme but that would have to be the case. Yes. They're not doing it because it's hard. They're doing it because it's easy. Like you and I drive to a restaurant and, and have dinner and, and, and drive back home. We do it because it's easy. Right. Yeah, and these are the, we have to overcome that time dilation and everything else that would occur. Yeah, it's more, like you said, it's more likely, it's less likely that there's something like an Alcubierre drive, which again is a fascinating idea. I mean, whether or not it's practical, that's okay. It, it's good to go through these thought experiments anytime you have, even if you're smoking weed and you have a good idea. Yeah, if then you, once you sober <laughs> up, go through the thought experiment, see if it yields to any, it leads to anything. That's great. Um, so that, you know, those kinds of ideas are probably impractical. So more likely, you know, uh, so number one, I, I ha again have to be the extreme uh, experimentalists. I, I do not necessarily think that there are other civilizations in the universe because I haven't seen any evidence for them. I'm not saying it's not true, but I'm just saying I will wait until we see some kind of evidence for that until I assent to the reality of that. That's that's the way I am. 
Um, but under the assumption that there are, which is fine, it's a fine assumption for a thought experiment, right? As you pointed out, they're probably taking advantage of general relativity in ways that we are not and we can't right now. So if we have a civilization, and again, this idea of different rankings of civilizations, ours is a fairly primitive one based upon, you know, the civilization that has, you know, that has advanced enough to be able to capture all the energy of its star, for example, something like that. <clears throat> They have probably also been able to create devices that can make, you know, wormholes. They can make black holes. Maybe they know how to create black holes in a certain way and manipulate them so that they, they can make a black hole that has a wormhole inside that is traversable. <laughs> so these are all enormous, completely speculative ideas for us in our civilization. But yeah, if you had some other civilization on the on the scale, on a higher up on the scale, they could have, they could have, you know develop this and that would be fascinating so more likely they're doing something like that you know so where you create a kind of interstellar style portal right where you you know in it and this is a good this is a good usage of the word portal right it's like when people tell me these things like oh is cern opening a portal on the eclipse uh, the day of the eclipse it's like well no because also uh, i don't know what you mean by the word portal but uh, you know if we're talking you about guys like, did I, do that right did you guys find the <laughs> gates of hades <laughs> when, when I when I when I get the tour of CERN and thank you for the invitation, it's going to be great. I want to go to the Hades room. Just, just, <laughs> yeah. Just, I, just, I I don't know where this room is. I'm sorry. It's, you know, I, we we have we have lots of pieces of art here. You know, like we have a statue of Shiva, which was given by the Indian government. That's again is normal. There's lots of pieces of art here. This is a piece of art back here as well behind me. You know, it's a, or not really a piece of art. It's a little cross section of one of the dipoles. Anyway, so I, I have, I have worked here for 10 years. I've never seen, you know, the Hades room. I have no idea what people are talking about. When talk about <laughs> right, <this. laughs> right, right. Um, but then, of course, that, that is what I would say, isn't it? Yeah, that's <laughs> it. That's it. You, you know what? You're a company man. You're a company <laughs> man. So... <laughs> Here, here's a, another part that uh, I need some help understanding with the word dark and applying dark to dark matter. And then we have matter and antimatter as well. Yeah. Is dark matter antimatter? No. Okay. And it, it's called dark because we can't see it? Yeah, so there's three things going on here that you've kind of uh, alluded to. So as we talked about earlier in the show, we really currently on, only understand about 5% of the universe, what it's made of. And this is this regular so-called baryonic matter. It's the stuff that's the standard model of particle physics, the stuff that I, you know, that I study. And then, of course, I look for beyond the standard model. So I'm right at that edge there with my research. Um, but we really don't understand what this 95% of the universe is. However, that 95%, there's two different things going on. And in fact, they're totally separate, totally separate things that have the word dark in front of them. Um, so dark matter is responsible for something like, what is it, 25, 26% of the universe. And then the rest is this dark energy. And this is the so-called but the stuff budget of the universe. If you make the pie chart of the stuff budget of the universe, these are the percentages. And so this dark matter, we know for a fact that dark matter exists. We just don't know what it is. And that's a bit of a sticky wicket because we have been searching for decades and we found exactly zero particles of this stuff. And it's very, very weird. Um, but, you know, we know that dark matter exists because we see its effects on the cosmos due to gravity. So, you know, you take your favorite spiral galaxy and you, you know, you count up all the stuff that you can see and it's shaped like a spiral because it's spinning. And we know, again, from the textbook on gravity and your bedside table, you know how fast it's supposed to be spinning based upon how much stuff is in the galaxy. And so then you, you make that prediction, then you calculate, you observe how fast it's going. It's moving way faster than it should. And it's, in fact, it should fly apart based upon the amount of stuff. Therefore, there must be one of two things going wrong. Either gravity is wrong and it's probably not, but, or there's more stuff than what we can see with our telescopes. And if it's not light, then it's dark. So that's where the word dark comes from. And that doesn't actually mean mysterious. It doesn't mean we don't know what we're talking about. It just means that it doesn't interact via electromagnetism. So if that's the case, then there's got to be more stuff and we can calculate how much, in fact, very accurately, we can calculate how much dark matter is in the universe and it's, it's everywhere and it's in every galaxy, including our own. So that means that you right now have about a billion particles of dark matter flowing through your body every second. 
So, you know, trying to detect this stuff is very difficult because it's been flowing through us all the time and we've never, it never bumps into us. It never does anything to us. So this is can't you, can't you trap it like in a magnetic box or something? Well, magnetic, no, because it doesn't interact by electromagnetism. You know, again, that's the right. problem with this thing. If dark matter, so if dark matter is a particle or some kinds of particles, and that's a good assumption, it's not a bad assumption, it's a fine assumption. Um, under the assumption that it is a particle or some kinds of particles, you have to assume that at some point it does, quote unquote, interact with regular matter like you and me. Because if it doesn't, we're basically screwed. <laughs> if dark matter only interacts by gravity, we're kind of screwed because there's no way for us to really, we can't manipulate gravity on such kind of tiny levels to be able to understand and detect a particle. Like a particle of gravity doesn't, you know, graviton we've never, we've never detected. So under the assumption that dark matter is a particle, we then have to assume there's probably some other force of nature that we haven't discovered yet. Well, there's only four that we know of. Gravity is this one that's very weird and just determined by general relativity. Then there's the three others that are determined by, that are governed by quantum mechanics and the stuff that's in the standard model. And these are electromagnetism, something called the weak force and something called the strong force. And these are all that we know of right now. Any, anything that happens in the universe is some combination of those. But if dark matter interacts with us matter at all, we assume that probably if it does, it's it's got to be by some new force of nature that's extremely feeble compared to the others. And by feeble, I mean it almost never happens. Again, because you have bar dark matter popping through your body all the time, never bumps into you. So the way that we try to not trap it, but just detect it, detect that it bumps into something else is through various means. And one way is these, you know, these mind-based experiments, uh, xenon, or, you know, you've probably heard these names before. Really what they do, <clears throat> you know, if dark matter has been going through your body your whole life and it's never bumped into you, it just means your body, your body is a bad dark matter detector. So instead, what if we take like an enormous vat and fill it with, say, xenon, a noble gas or something like that, so it's very stable, and then you put it like underneath a mine or a, uh, underneath a mountain or something like that to shield out all possible sources of, you know, cosmic rays or something like that. And you let it sit there for a certain amount of time. Eventually, if dark matter does bump into it, it, which we assume that it has to do at some point, otherwise, again, like I said, we're kind of out of luck. If it does eventually, and then on the outside of the vat, you put a bunch of, you know, uh, detector pieces that can see a little flash of light or something like that. If a dark matter particle does eventually bump into a xenon nucleus, it probably does so via this dark force. Again, dark just means that we, you know, we haven't observed it yet. It probably does so via this dark force, which means there'd be a new dark force carrying particle as well, something like a dark photon. As these things get close together, they zap each other with this force. And then we would see this sort of, it would then eventually lead to like an electron or a photon coming off that then we could see in our detector material. So that's great. We can do that. We have an enormous vat, put it down in a mine, let it sit there for a year and see what you see. If you don't see anything, it does not mean that dark matter doesn't exist. It means that dark matter interacts with xenon at a rate of less than one flash per year for this volume. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, that so makes sense. Wanna... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah, a kind of, it's a kind of, it's a kind of, you know, it's like a pushing game, right? It's like, okay, well, you have a kind of, you know, dark matter might interact with regular matter at this certain rate way up here. Now, okay, it, we've set, let it sit there for years, so it has to be a rate lower than this. So let it sit there for two years, it has to be a rate lower than this. Build a bigger volume and, and let it sit there for 10 years, it has to be a rate lower than this. And eventually you just kind of go farther and farther and farther down until you throw up your hands and say, okay, this paradigm isn't working out. What else could dark matter be? And that is the place we are right now. So right now is a super, super weird time for physics in general, because honestly, and for my field, especially in particle physics, right? Because this Higgs boson was an amazing discover, fantastic, but it was just the last extremely lucky piece of this whole, like almost 125 years of clockwork discoveries in physics. Like the 20th century was an extremely lucky time for physicists to be alive because there were all these enormous paradigm shifts and these enormous hints, like these big theoretical hints, they were all followed by discoveries. It's like enormous hint, big discovery, enormous hint, big discovery, enormous hint, big discovery, up to and including the Higgs boson. But the problem is that we're completely out of big hints. We really are like there's no big hint as to where the quantum black hole is or where the you know exotic cousins of the higgs boson are or where dark matter is we don't have any big hints anymore 
and we have huge open questions. So we kind of have to switch our brains away from chasing hints uh, back to a more kind of like exploratory framework, which is kind of daunting experimentally because for dark matter, for example, it's not just how, how uh, frequently or infrequently it interacts with regular matter which is all of our, you know, our detectors are made of regular matter, so they have to, it has to be some kind of interaction. It's not just the rate at which it interacts, it's also the mass of this thing. So that's another axis along our, our uh, you know, exploratory investigation, right? The problem though with dark matter is in fact, the range of masses is enormous. Like dark matter, something that does the job of dark matter could have a, a mass, quote unquote, that's something like, you know, micro EV or, you know, something extremely small. Whereas, you know, for, and by say, when I say EV, like electron volts. So for example, the, the proton has a mass of about one giga electron volt. So mm -hmm. dark matter mass could be something that's extremely tiny, like milli, uh, milli electron volts, or it could be something up to masses of stars and planets. Like this is an enormous range. And one experiment is never going to be able to test this you know, definitively. So we're at this, you know, and again, like I said, it was, it's a very, it was a very good thing to go through this, this, uh, this exercise of building these big, uh, these big vats of xenon. And in fact, we can search for dark matter here at the Large Hadron Collider. We don't wait for it to bump into other particles. Instead, we smash other particles together and see if dark matter comes off. It's the same, it's the same interaction, just kind of like you know, you're switching it in from a different direction. The particle physicists that kind of like where the sort of uh, um, where the uh, uh, the you know the the impatient little kid. We don't want to wait. We want to make it happen. We want to smash things together, <laughs> and so we can look for this too. And this is the so-called WIMP paradigm. We don't need to go into the details, but this is weakly interacting massive particle. This is one particular paradigm for how dark matter could have been, and it was very very good. It was a very it was a big hint. It was an amazing one wonderful sort of like big, big theoretical hint. The problem is that it has not worked out in the term, in terms of a discovery. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that the, the rate of interaction is getting so low that it's basically, it's nearly impossible for us to improve upon it anymore. So we've started to have to look into different ways to try to discover dark matter. And it's wild. It could be a large number of possible things. One of these is, for example, pr primordial black holes. If you haven't had, uh, you know, if you haven't had, you know, my colleague Jacob Schultz on, you should talk to him about his idea that, you know, there's some astronomers have noticed that back in the outer edges of our solar system, several of the kind of larger rocks, you know, not, not planets, but big rocks, they're orbiting in sort of weird ways. And they postulate that you can explain this if there's a new planet, so-called planet nine, maybe you've had Constantine on as well, but planet nine is, you know, this would nicely explain. However, we haven't seen a visible planet, planet nine. So my other colleague, Jacob is a close friend of mine. He's like, huh, wait a minute. What if the reason we haven't seen planet nine is that it's not actually a planet, but is it a black hole about the size of an apple, so-called primordial black hole that was formed just after the big bang and then floated around the universe for billions of years before, you know, getting stuck in our solar system. That would explain why we haven't seen it. So in fact, if you had enough of these primordial black holes, they could in principle make up the density of dark matter as well. We, we, we have never, we've never detected a single primordial black hole, however, <laughs> because they're very hard to detect. You know, imagine trying to detect an apple sized black hole far, far, far out near the Oort cloud. That's crazy. Now, but, but the mathematics says there's something out there. That's, that's yeah. the crazy thing that the math says something is messing with Neptune. I mean, the math, it, it, it's, it's just the math. Um, oh, yeah. it's, it, it's so far away, it's not reflecting sunlight, and therefore, uh, no matter what it is, we just can't see it. But exactly. something is, is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Constantine, my, my colleague Constantine thinks, you know, he thinks that the black hole idea is very fun, but he's, you know, he's, of course, convinced that eventually we will detect this planet 9, we will see it. It's just probably small enough that it's just so hard. I mean, it's, like you pointed out, it's so far out there. Like, that's not easy to spot, you know? It takes a long time to be able to spot that. But the primordial black hole idea, the apple-sized black hole idea has taken hold. I mean, probably you noticed that, you know, even people like uh, Edward Witten took it took it seriously and wrote a paper, a follow-up paper. It's like, oh, okay, if this were true, then we should send a, you know, we should send a, so, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a, 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 a mission out there to, to look for it. And then we could detect it by so-and-so way. <laughs> so, well, you know, Leonard Susskind, 
who who I absolutely adore, right? Cranky, fun, cool, thinks outside the box. And what I like when you have a, um, a, especially a theoretical physicist, as they get older, they all those thoughts that they would never speak out loud, <laughs> they start saying these things. But one of the things that um, he he has said, and I love this, that it's everything is probable. That's it. That's that's it. That's it. Any crazy thought that you can think of will happen. It may not happen tomorrow, but eventually it will. And and that's that's I just think that's the best way to look at it. No matter what you want to uh try to think up, eventually it's a numbers game and and those atoms and particles are going to do their thing, and that crazy thought of yours is going to become reality. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a nice poetic thought, you know, metaphorical for humans too, right? We should not limit ourselves based upon you know the kind of constrictions that the the world puts on us, you know, society and you know cultures and things. It's like no, you know, if you really have this idea, if you really have a visualization of you know something, you should work for it. You should push toward it. You should try to make it happen. Don't let people tell you that it's not going to happen. Um, and of course, this is fun too. And the kind of you know the 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 probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics comes in here, as you know, with this concept of the say the Boltzmann brain, right? It's like you know if you have you know long enough time scales, you know the universe, as we know, we talked about earlier, the universe will continue to expand. It seems like it's going to continue to expand forever, and at some point, in some enormously you know long time, longer than the human mind can comprehend. The universe will reach a state of absolute, nearly absolute zero temperature and maximum entropy, which from one perspective means that literally nothing can ever happen in the universe ever again. And will stay that way probably for eternity, right? That's fairly daunting. However, quantum mechanics also has fluctuations built into it. It has these probabilistic things. So over long enough time scales, yes, something like, you know, for example, a complete brain will pop into existence out of nothing. <laughs> Probabilistically, it kind of has to happen. <laughs> it, it, it has to. I mean, you and I cruising around in our starship, right? A trillion years from now. Absolutely. And, and a Ford Mustang pops up. What's that doing out here? Well, <laughs> it just happened. And then poof, it disappears like the Boltzmann brain. You know, it's, you know, yeah, exactly. It, it'll, it'll be there for a minute. Um, how you never answered long, the antimatter question, by the way. I never. I, never I was going there. I was. I was going there. Right. So, uh, in the short time that we have left, when we look at antimatter, uh, now, okay, let's go to the allegedly part. I need you to confirm it. You're sitting at CERN. So if you can't answer the question, just tap your foot once for yes or twice for no. Okay, fair enough. I don't want I don't want the men in black to come in the room and start shutting stuff down. <laughs> Have you guys created antimatter? Oh yeah, antimatter. We make it all the time. Like here's the thing. <laughs> okay, oh, stop, 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 stop. I'm right there. Stop no, no, right no, no, there. We have to okay. Uh, okay. We have to so, so, so the answer is yes. Now, if it touches anything, it's it's a really bad news. It, it takes entropy to a whole nother level. The second law of thermodynamics is yeah. is is off the table. But um, how do you contain it? And and how much of it are you creating? Do you suspend it somehow? It can't touch anything. Yeah. Well, okay. So here's the thing. So uh, antimatter, in fact, is nothing mysterious. I mean, there are certain things about it that we, you know, there's things that we measure about it and things that we can do research on, but it's not an unknown like dark matter is. Dark matter is completely separate. Dark matter, we have no frigging clue what it is now. You know, it's, it's this effect that we see due to gravity, but the particle nature is totally unknown. Antimatter, we understand quite well. We make it all the time. And when you say antimatter, it's really just a kind of more complex version of what is known as an antiparticle, right? It's a, it's a, and antiparticles are all over the place. They're not so common around you and me, you know. And in fact, it's one of the big open questions of physics right now is why is our universe primarily made of matter and not antimatter? 
because at the moment of the Big Bang, around the moment of the Big Bang, these should have been produced in, in equal numbers because That's of right. charge conservation, right? Again, <laughs> if you remember your high school physics, people remember their high school physics. Universe doesn't really care about a lot of anything except for conservation laws. It loves conservation laws, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, charge, various things. And so one of these things is conservation of charge. We've never seen any violations of this. But so, and so you might imagine if you're, you know, if you're making a universe and you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, in your in your kitchen and you want it to be symmetrical, which and and follow conservation laws, which you probably would, you would have as it started to expand, you'd have an equal amount of matter and antimatter. But that's going to be a very boring universe because, as you pointed out, as it starts to expand, all of that stuff will, you know, will then attract each other and annihilate with just a bunch of bursts of, you know, radiation. And you just have a, a universe filled with photons and that's it. Okay, that's pretty boring. But that didn't happen in a universe. Something happened, some tiny, tiny imbalance. Something caused an imbalance so that there was some tiny fraction more of regular matter than, than antimatter. And so all, most of the antimatter and matter annihilated and sent off radiation. But then just a little bit amount of regular matter won out and then stayed around to eventually uh, turn into structures and you and me and you know potatoes and things like that. So what caused this, this imbalance is totally unknown. And we this is the type of thing that we we study here, we try to look for answers for this. But antimatter itself is really just, you know, kind of complex versions of these antiparticles. And antiparticles we make all the time. So an electron has an antiparticle called a positron. Okay, that's great. From one perspective, that is antimatter because we make positrons all the time in our in our colliders. In fact, the collider that was inside the the tunnel of the, the Large Hadron Collider now, previously back in the 90s, was called the Large Electron-Positron Collider, LEP. That's right. And so we made we made a beam of pro positrons. This stuff is not, this you know, this is very well understood, discovered a long time ago. But when you, so what you're getting at though is this so-called antimatter where you take certain amounts of stuff and you, know, you make not just, you know, say a, a positron, but say make an antiproton. And there's no antiprotons around you right now. So that's unique. So the way that they do that is that, yeah, they have special devices so that you start to make antiprotons in a certain way. And then you can kind of, you, you know, you you have a way that they don't live for very long either. But yeah, it's also just a single antiproton. It doesn't have a lot of kinetic energy and it also is not very massive. And if it meets another proton, it's just going to send off a burst of energy and it's not going to do anything. So they don't really need to work that hard to keep it isolated. And, you know, the calculation has been done, you know, in, in fact, uh, before before you know many years ago um i think it was primarily not primarily but it was partially inspired by the dan brown book where was it angels and demons or something like that i haven't read it but this notion where there's like a plot point where there's like a an antimatter bomb made at cern to like bomb the vatican or something like that i don't know that this is not going to be possible because you can calculate that you would probably need to, i forget what it was you'd probably need to run the the experiments here for something like ten thousand years to build up enough antimatter to be able to do anything macroscopically uh, difficult like a bomb. Oh, man, you're bumming me out. So you don't have an antimatter <laughs> vault, you know, with guards in no. front of it? You don't no, sell it? A really... you don't, you can, there, you no. can sell it to the Illuminati. <laughs> we could. I mean, it'd be great to have, like, imagine that you could have, like, a, an actual little chamber that says inside here is one antiproton at the gift shop, right? You got to take it home. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> don't, it says don't jostle it. Otherwise, you're anti you're, you're Don't shake it. Yeah, yeah. Don't shake it. <laughs> uh, don't shake it. Um, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, no, but in fact, uh, you know, in fact, when you do come to visit, I'll take you to the antimatter factory. And in fact, they did it. They put a, an enormous uh, sign on the outside that says this in enormous blue letters, antimatter factory. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, one last thing as 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 we wrap up here, um, time travel. Now we we addressed you know getting to the speed of light and infinite mass. I I don't know theoretically. I've heard different ideas, but if you get there, let's say you you get to one hundred percent, apparently time stops. Right, every infinite mass. That's it. Now, from our observation, from from the way that we're observing it, but if we're on the ship at the speed of light, we wouldn't feel the infinite infinite mass. I don't think we would. Still, you and I would be talking in real time, 
but back on earth or whoever's observing us, we're not moving. Right. Is that the best way to um, look at it? Yeah. Something like that. But again, we have to keep in mind that from when I say plain vanilla, I mean, you know, without any kind of tricks, which we would definitely need, it's just not going to be possible for us to go at the speed of light. Yeah. Well, there, there, but, there is this, but, there, there is a limit put by, by nature. Like you would never be able to read. I mean, infinite doesn't exist. Like, the, yeah, the, I'm the just wondering, are, you know, at, at that point, you know, so we're there, we're at a hundred percent of the speed of light and then somebody passes us. Right. Yeah, that so imagine, <laughs> well, imagine we were, Imagine we were to make ourselves massless, and then we would have to be going at the speed of light. And that's true. We would not experience time in the way that we experience it now. It would basically stop. So, so photons how, don't really experience light. Before we run out of time, mm -hmm. this is, uh, and I know you've thought about this. So uh, Einstein uh, presents it pretty elegantly, right? Okay, so you jump on your ship. You head out at a tenth, 10% 10 of the speed of light. You go out for a couple of years. You come back to Earth. Everybody's dead. You know, you're 100 years or 1,000 years in the future. It, it, it just depends on the distance and time. All right. right. But in science fiction, they don't address this. Everybody's warp driving out and coming back. And, you know, it, it, nobody's going back in time. Right, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's it, it's it's too freely done, um, traveling at these great speeds and then coming back to the point of origin, like nothing happened. When you wouldn't be in the t same time and space, right? You understand what yeah. I'm saying? It, it's it's yeah. it's 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 glossed Most over. Very much so. I mean, most science fiction that deals with time travel necessarily takes a lot of liberties with the real physics. The ones that don't, that, you know, that try to hew to the real physics are really fantastic. You know, for example, Interstellar does a very good job, you know, okay, up until the moment when, you know, it says that if you go inside of a black hole, you go back in time behind your daughter's bookshelf. That's probably not what happens, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but at least, but at least what they did there is they tried to approach this with a real, you know, and again, they had, uh, what was it? Kip Thorne to yeah, University Kip Thorne. Yeah. 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 To, Hats off to, to Kip to, on to that for on sure. That. And again, because they, they deliberately talked about that, right. As you, if you stay far enough away from the black hole, you know, the, the spaceship that goes closer and then comes, turns around the turn around part is the crucial part, right? If they'd stayed away, you'd never be able to compare and you wouldn't mean anything but once you turn around and come back suddenly their clocks are totally different but you know going back in time you know backwards time travel is a sticky one because although you can find solutions of the einstein equations that allow this in a way some people claim that this is probably not possible in our universe and it's one of those things that's a bit weird because you know we we use the math and you should always look closely at the math in physics as you know um, that's why you know people get PhDs so they can look closely at the math, right? Um, but you should never, at the end of the day, you can't be slaves to the math because you have to be slaves to the observation. Does that make sense? And again, I think I'm patting myself on the back as an experimentalist, right? Because you know this is we are the ones that are the arbiters of the best understanding of the universe now, of the of the world now. And so, in the mathematics, even though it says that you know in in general relativity, for example, it says that things like white holes are possibility. We've never observed a white hole. Black holes are possibility. Yes, we have seen the black holes exist. So why does our universe seem to use black holes but not white holes? That's a bit weird. Also, it seems as though it be, could be quite possible to create uh, forward time travel. So you might be able to jump forward. But you, and also from the equations, it seems like backward time travel is possible, these so-called closed time-like curves. But then you have to factor in other observations. As you know, this, you know, whatever the, this, the Fermi paradox or something like that. If that's the case, then why has no... Why have no humans from the future ever come back to 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 you know to uh, to say hi to us? This has never happened, as, at least as far as we know. And so that you know that starts to make you think that this kind of a thing is probably not possible. Again, maybe somebody. Again, I I I at the end of the day, I always you know I always leave open the possibility that someone in the future will come up with a way to test these kinds of things. But that's the state of stuff right now. Yeah, I, I think about that all the time. You know, you and I, you know, we head out, you know, on our ship and we come back a thousand years in the future. And, 
and we step off the you know the ship and okay we're here now have you guys figured out time travel yet we'd like to go back no can't do it <laughs> Yeah, dude, you're stuck. Yeah. You're stuck. Maybe they, they were people from 500 years from the future. And they're like, yeah, we're stuck here too. We didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I, I think about that all the time. Um, Sounds like James, a Futurama James, episode. Yeah, 100%. This has been a fantastic show. Uh, I have one last question. I don't want... Uh, uh, we're going to be off the network in 15 seconds, but we can continue... Uh, the, uh, here for a few more minutes. It'll exist in our archives this way. Uh, yeah, we're we're now officially off the network. Bye, everybody. Okay. The, the energy, both uh, the weak and the strong forces, that bind everything together, it seems like they need, it needs to eat some food to produce the energy. And to to allow the bind, which is strong. I mean, that is a crazy force, right? But will it eventually run out where everything just kind of poofs, right? And all the glue that holds us together just stops, right? We're, we're assuming it, it's forever, but it can't be, can it? That is one of the zillion dollar questions. Um, and the answer is we don't know. So there are various uh, various theories uh, and ideas as to, you know, for example, the eventual fate of the universe. Yeah, and um, this eventual fate of the universe, as we pointed out, you know, some people we we know that the fate of the universe. It seems, as far as we understand now, that um, accelerated expansion of the universe will go on forever, and that means that eventually everything is just going to get farther and farther apart, and we'll have this kind of, you know, completely empty dark space you know where nothing light is everything will be so far away that light would never there's no chance for it to ever get to wherever you happen to be and then eventually but then uh, so we think that there's various assumptions you have to make as to what the eventual fate of the universe will be like far 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 in the future um and one of those assumptions is whether or not uh protons decay so we have never seen proton decay this is we never observed this and so it, what, but it, it doesn't mean it doesn't, but we've seen neutron decay. Neutron decay happens all the time, right? And protons and neutrons are pretty related. They're stuck into nuclei and in all in our bodies right now. So why should a neutron decay after about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, a free neutron, but a proton never does. We've never seen a proton decay. Okay. So it's not, it's, it's not necessarily true that protons don't decay. They might actually have a natural lifetime. It's just that it has to be something enormously high right now. So if you put in the assumption that eventually protons may decay, and then if that's the case, if that's the case, all of that decay means that it will just sort of break apart and it will, all the stuff will turn into, you know, turn into pure radiation, then that leads to one type of final eventual state of the universe. If you assume that protons never decay, then you will always have some kind of strong force and maybe even protons themselves will just kind of hang around for, for a very long time. So we don't know the answer to this. It's kind of lonely. It's a, it's a, it's a messed up thought. It, 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 the, in the last chapter of Brian Greene's book until the end of time, uh, I'm assuming you've read it. And if you haven't, uh, pick it up. It's a, it's a good read. He, he, you know, we're talking about thousands of trillions of years in the future, right? Okay. At the, at the, at the end of time. And when it's all said and done, um, and everything does break apart. This is what he says. He says, all that will be left is thought. That that's not going anywhere. And it's just a weird, you know, it's a weird statement from him. What is he actually trying to say? He says thinking will continue. And that it will need energy to survive so it's going to float around in in nothing looking for the lone you know <laughs> some crazy particle whizzing by and and gobble it up but that that's it that's that's is he trying to say consciousness without using that word all right 
<laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's, you it's know, a I don't, weird. I don't know. It is. It's a it's a strange statement. Um, and I have, of course, read The Elegant Universe, but I've not read this other one by him. So I'll have to get to it. Um, and in fact, Elegant Universe is one of the reasons why I'm a physicist. So, you know, I owe a it's lot. It's such of, a great uh, book. It's hard to believe it's that old now. Wow. I know. It's crazy to think how old it is. But for that concept, you know, again, I'd ha I think you'd have to talk, ask Brian more about what he means by that, because I hear these kinds of statements and I don't really understand why the person is making the statement, because it really is has no basis in science. <laughs> if I understand what your description of it correctly. Hey, yeah, it's Brian's. It's Brian's words, not, not but, mine. But, you know what he but said? what is thought? Like thought, though, again, is extremely human-centered. It's extremely hubristic. It's like, again, human-centered. Like this concept of anytime we say these things, like, you know, thought or consciousness, that to me is, again, like I said, it's a very, it's a, it's a kind of a very egotistical way to think about things. Why should we think that we're anything special? The way that we interact with the universe, why, why is that something special and unique? I mean, it's special to us because we don't see any other beings, but it's, maybe it's not the only way to interact with the universe or to be part of the universe. And so when I think about what my thoughts being somehow, like transcending physical reality that's that to me is getting to the edge of theology that's getting into the realm of parts of things that again science doesn't have anything to do with i, I don't understand where this thought would come from again but again maybe i haven't read him correctly and, and, and i think he was abducted by aliens and he got some inside <laughs> information i mean it, 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 if you yeah. look at it in those terms and again i, I know it's very late and we can wrap up uh, it's just a great conversation is that we, let's let's suppose let's go Leonard Susskin, ET e shows up right everything's probable ET shows up, and they step off and and okay so uh, where's Beecham? We want to talk to Beecham right? <laughs> He's over here. So you step you start talking and and and, and you ask him. So is physics the same on your side of the universe as it is here? And what do you do if they come back with, we haven't messed with physics in a billion years. <laughs> We're beyond that. And, and, and I, I, that's where, that, that's where I think things are probably going to go. It, it, and, and, and again, I'm just saying we're, we're at our level of understanding, right? And it's a fantastic, I love I love what we have done. See these guitars behind me? That's human ingenuity. That's genius, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. That's genius. Yep. I love where but but in the future, I don't I don't I don't know where it's going to take us, but I think we need to move up a level. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, some people have talked about as you know, they talk about how, you know, 20th century was the was the um the century of physics, you know, as as the science. And then um, but we're kind of at this sort of, you know, desert point for physics where the next guaranteed discoveries, like I pointed out before, are so far beyond what we can do that they kind of they make us very frustrated. And so some people think that maybe the 21st century is going to be the the century of biology, right, because we're doing all these things with CRISPR and, you know, and tissue, uh, uh, you know, uh, generation and and understanding, you know, um, uh, neuroscience and things like that. And if that's the case, then maybe there's something coming up that is a kind of game changer. That's a sort of an enormous paradigm shift, like, you know, uh, 1905 and 1915 and then quantum mechanics, like all these crazy things that happen in terms of physics in the 20th century. Maybe those things are happening for, are coming up for biology too. If that's the case, then I, I, again, I can't even speculate what those are because, you know, right. I'm not a biologist, but what you know what if one of those things yeah i i agree it's a totally fine what if that there's some kind of enor enormous paradigm shift that happens so that there's uh, our understanding of biology becomes much more complex than it is now in a much more fantastic way you know that points us toward how we might be able to elucidate um what we refer to as you know human ingenuity or consciousness or whatever you know that's fine uh, right now i can't i i i like i said before i don't fully understand why consciousness is such um, a big deal for a lot of people. I think it's, you know, sort of first principles version of it. It's a very complex or extremely complex phenomenon, but in principle, totally, totally describable. You know, maybe I'll be proven wrong, though. Maybe somebody will come up and say, ah, okay, no, in fact, 
biology does blah, blah, blah. And this is why then it's very clear that other civilizations or other, you know, beings in the universe would have to do so and so and so and so. So that's great. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, though, there's certain things, I don't know, there's certain things about existence that I, I don't, you know, human existence that I don't, it, it's okay if we don't try to describe them by physics, <laughs> you know, like, or, or try to describe them We're not them supposed by, to know. Yeah, we're just well, not supposed I don't know about to know. Supposed, I don't know about supposed to, it's just that it's not necessary in a way, you know, for example, like, there's no experiment that I can de de design to prove that, I don't know, my grandmother loved me. There's no, and also, why would I want to design an experiment to test that? Like that's that's completely beyond what the concept of love is, right? Love is a human human conception. It's totally okay to allow it to be beautiful poetry, or you know, or for example, I I don't want to have a scientific uh, explanation. I don't need a scientific explanation for uh, you know that guitar solo that Prince does on on stage for the for the George Harrison tribute for the during the while my guitar gently weeps and he does this incredible solo and everybody's just stunned and like they're completely like you're you even just thinking about it now the hair on my arm is standing up and then he throws his guitar into the air and it doesn't come down and he walks away okay I know there's a physical reason to that but there's certain things about the poetry of life it's okay to let them be poetry I also don't think that we need to extrapolate into the future and say, and, you know, 10 to the power 1,000 years, it's only going to be thought, man. <laughs> I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> Again, who was maybe, it? Maybe who I... was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Who was it in, uh, I love that. We'll end with this. Who was it? It was like 1860. He said, ah, there's nothing left to, there's hmm. nothing left to learn. Yes. Uh, um, I forget who this was. But yeah, he gave uh, a conference at like the University of Chicago or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. All the main stuff of physics has been <laughs> we, basically understood. It's just <laughs> really little pieces now. There's nothing left. <laughs> James, perfect show, my friend. Thank you so much. And I look forward to our next conversation. Now, uh, go bang some stuff together. All right? I will. I'll go smash some par protons together. <laughs> I'll talk to you, James. Thank you, Thanks my brother. So perfect show. My Where pleasure. can everybody reach out to you? Oh, uh, I've got a nice website um, where I, I try to put down my upcoming speaking events and my uh, appearances. Um, you can find me on TikTok. I don't use it. I haven't used it in a, a while, but I'm probably going to go back to it soon. I've got a nice uh, community built up there. Um, uh, you can also find me, I don't know, LinkedIn. Uh, I don't use social media very much, um, but feel free to follow me on uh, TikTok and Instagram, things like that. Um, but probably it's easiest just to get on my website and sign up for the for my um for my uh, little uh, update, you know, um, what do you call it? Email list. That's probably the easiest. Yeah, newsletter, email list. There That's you the go. <laughs> James, go smash some particles, brother. Thank well, you I've so got, much. I've got a book. I got a book in the pipeline too, but that's. I'll let you know when that's coming. We'll, you know, we can talk about that next time. We'll Thanks have so you much. back. Thank you, James. Thanks. Have a great night. Perfect show. Perfect show. I know I ran over. Uh, everybody, and we've been off the network uh, for quite a bit, but you got an extra 15 minutes of bonus time. So there you go. Fade to black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What are we doing tomorrow night? Does anybody know? Tomorrow night, Dr. Lynn Katai is with us. We're going to be talking about the Phoenix Lights. All right. Thank you, James. Perfect show. Fade to black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Bill. Thank you, Dex. Thank you, John Aside. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Lincoln Tie, I want you to behave, be safe, go backly tappy.